Hello, everyone, and happy School Nurse Day. My name is Ryan. I'm here on behalf of uh, the school health team, and we're very excited to be able to bring today's Self Care for Healthcare presentation to you. At School Health, we are continually inspired by the passion and the dedication and the perseverance of school nurses like you. And on this School Nurse Day and during National Nurses Week, we wanted to take a moment to say thank you for everything that you do during the school year and beyond. And as part of that, we have a very special guest with us today. Leanne Thiemann is a Hall of Fame speaker. She is a nurse. She is a New York Times uh, bestselling author of 15 of the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, including her newest, which is Chicken Soup for the Soul, Inspiration for Nurses. And uh, this latest book of hers has already reached over a million hands, a uh, million minds, hearts, and souls of health caregivers. Now, her mission is to reach you, uh, school nurses, with um, her new book called Self Care for Healthcare, which is your guide to physical, mental, and spiritual health. This transformational program is a movement and philosophy based program that creates behavior changes resulting in positive culture impact, increased employee engagement, increased morale, increased retention better patient satisfaction scores, better outcomes, and reimbursements. During today's presentation, Leanne will recount some stories from her dramatic experiences from the Vietnam Orphan Airlift Project and from her chicken soup uh, books that she has written. Leanne shares some life-changing lessons uh, for coping in the war zones that we can face today, and her inspirational, poignant, and humorous presentations help teach us all to take uh, to, to have tools that are a balance in our lives and to truly live our priorities and make a difference in the world. Leanne has been featured in Newsweek Magazine's Voices of the Century. She has been featured on Fox News, PBS, the BBC, NPR, and on countless radio and television programs. And her messages of hope continue to inspire people around the world. So many people say, just when I thought I couldn't do it anymore, I listened to Leanne. We're very excited to bring this to you today. Before I turn the time over to Leanne, I would like to review a few quick things about today's webinar. Uh, first, we will not be taking audio questions, but you can submit questions for Leanne through the questions interface in GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions at any time during the presentation, and then we will take some time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. Uh, also, the webinar will be recorded and a link will be posted to the schoolhealth.com website. We will also email a copy of the link to all of you who have registered so that you can watch this for few, uh, future playback. And everyone who attends today's webinar will also be receiving a certificate in the, of attendance uh, in the mail for joining us today. I'm, I'm sorry, an email for joining us today. And you should expect to receive that later this afternoon. And lastly, if you are having any technical difficulties with the audio or visual portion of today's webinar, please contact GoToWebinar directly at 855-352-9003. And now let's turn the time over to Leanne. Okay. Well, I think most of you will probably agree that not much has changed since I graduated from nursing school, right? Back then, <laughs> there were no waiting lists, I got right in. Now, my very first job was on the post-op surgical unit, and we were so busy you might not believe it. They expected us to take care of four patients at the same time. Fortunately, back then, Many of them were 10-day post-op vaginal hysterectomies, three-day post-op tonsillectomies. But in spite of that heavy load, we gave excellent care, which of course made sure that we had patients had complete bed baths and we read them their mail, all that extra care, you know, that we don't have time to give today. Back then, my very first job and thereafter was as a school nurse. And at the time, I had one school to take care of. Sometimes at this hospital, though, when I was on the evening shift, I got to be the charge nurse, but usually the charge nurse was an older nurse. I mean, she had to be 
50. Now, she lovingly called me Brat. I lovingly called her Poston. I made it up. P-O-S-T-E-N. It stood for poor, old, sick, and tired elderly nurse. Now, Poston used to go on and on about how they used to do things in the old days. And sometimes I'm just trying to teach those younger nurses how we used to do things so they have an appreciation of the changes. And I realize I'm that old nurse now. I'm posted. And sometimes it feels like everything has changed. Patients don't stay in the hospital for 10 days anymore. And school nurse doesn't have one school to care for anymore. And the acuity of the care is just getting so much harder today. Hospitals are becoming intensive care units. Nursing homes are becoming hospitals and homes are becoming nursing homes. That's why we're facing such a tremendous nursing shortage. The government says we should be expecting to be 1 million nurses short within the next 10 years. And it's in part because it's just so stressful. I think one nurse said it best. She said, you know, working 3 to 11 at a long-term health care facility is never easy. Yet everybody there really loved the residents. They couldn't help but have a favorite. Alice was this wry, spry, sparkling, blue-eyed little lady. Now, her only living relative, though, was her son, Jack. He was this great, big, burly guy with a long, scraggly beard, long, greasy hair. He had tattoos all over his arms and his chest. And no matter what the weather was, Jack always wore a tank top. So everybody could admire the dragons and the snakes. He was rough, gruff, and mean. The nurses were actually afraid of him. They'd hear him roar up on his motorcycle. The flattened front door would fling open and they'd hear the click, click, click of that guy, his boots announcing his arrival. Well, one evening was the worst shift ever. Three nursing assistants called in sick. The trays came late and they were cold. And in the midst of this, one man fell and broke his hip. So here's this good nurse standing in the nurse's station, trying to do the work of four people. She was almost in tears. And she heard that front door fling open and the click, click, click of Jack's boots. And she knew he was right there glaring at her. But she said, if I looked at him, I would have cried out loud. Instead, she heard him stomp down the hall and go feed mama supper as he often did. Well, finally, at the end of this horrific shift, this good nurse single-handedly had every resident cared for and settled in for the night. And exhausted, she just put her head on the desk for a few minutes deep breath. And she heard that front door fling open and the click click and she thought, oh no, Jack caught me. And sure enough, she raised her head and he was this great big hairy burly arm and in the hand was a pickle jar with a piece of pink twine tied around the neck in a bow. And in it was one of the most beautiful long stemmed red roses she had ever seen. Jack handed it to her and said, looks like you're having a bad night. Well, this is from me and my mama. And she said, you know, of any gift she has ever received, nothing has quite touched her heart like that pickle jar and rose now some 30 years ago. We could use a few more pickle jars and roses in our lives as nurses, right? It is so hard. It's, it's so stressful. Important to remember, though, that not all stress is bad. There's that good kind of stress called eustress. Now, I had heard of euphoria. I had not heard of eustress. I learned it's a healthy stress that every living biological life form has that allows that life form to go on and be productive when everything's changing and everything's always changing. So we need some stress in our lives. But enough already, right? The American Surgeon General said, 80% of non-traumatic deaths in the United States are stress-related, 80%. So what causes all the stress for us? Well, there's long lists, I know. But the ones I hear from nurses and school nurses all over the country is just feeling like we have way too much to do and not enough time and resources to get it all done. Feeling like we're giving 100%, some days 110%, but feeling like that's not enough. No matter what I do, it's never enough. The stress of sometimes of finances, 
or health issues or relationships, and then you throw in COVID. And if a person has one or two of those going on in their lives, they can usually cope okay. But if we get more than one or two, not only are we not in eustress or stress, we get in distress. Are you ever in distress? How would I know, you ask? I've been this way so long. <laughs> well, that's why I made a list of too much stress in your life. It happens to be in my, my Self-Care for Healthcare book. And I'm going to read this list, and you can tell me if any of these might apply to you. Physical changes of too much stress might include appetite changes, headaches, fatigue, poor sleeping, frequent illnesses, digestive problems, a pounding heart, rash, restlessness, finger drumming, smoking, increased alcohol intake, nail biting. And friends, there are mental symptoms of too much stress, forgetfulness. Hope that's not a big problem because it sure applies to me. Forgetful, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> Poor concentration, dull senses, lethargy, boredom, low productivity, a negative attitude, anxiety, the blues, mood swings, anger, bad dreams, irritability, crying spells, nervous laughter, a lot of a loving feeling in our lives. And friends, there are spiritual symptoms from too much stress, feelings of emptiness, loss of meaning, doubt, martyrdom, loss of direction, cynicism, apathy, abandonment, worry, isolation, distrust, a feeling like nobody cares. So we have some of the causes. We have a, a list of the symptoms. So what do we do about it? Well, that's where I come in. Because I believe in order to cope with all the stressors we have in our lives, we've got to be strong physically, mentally, and spiritually. And to be strong in those three ways, we have to nurture ourselves in those three ways every single day. We can't just wait for weekends to catch up, to sleep in late, eat a big breakfast, and go to church. We need to take time every day. Even if it's in 15-minute increments to nurture our bodies, our minds, and our spirits. As I travel and talk to nurses, I'm more convinced than ever that we're so busy taking care of everybody else, you don't always take very good care of yourselves. Sometimes treating yourselves in ways that you would never treat a student or somebody you loved or cared for. Can you imagine saying to them, you can't have anything to eat today. I'm too busy to feed you. We would never say that to somebody else. We know how to eat right. We teach people how to eat right. But how often? Do you give yourselves the quality and the quantity of food your body needs in a timely manner? And sleep. We are becoming a sleep-deprived nation and certainly a sleep-deprived profession. We would never deny a child of sleep, and yet we do that to ourselves a lot. Science has proven that the human body requires, requires, seven to eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. If we're not giving it that, we are actually increasing our blood pressures, increasing our chances of depression, increasing digestive problems, shortening our life spans, increasing our fatty deposits. Aha, and now I have your attention, right? Right, yeah, shortening lifespan was one thing, but fatty deposits, now you're thinking I'm going to bed. Too often, we let things, we sacrifice sleep for everything else. We have to turn off technology, turn off electricity to get our bodies the seven to eight hours of sleep it really needs. And of course, physically, then there's exercise. Now, maybe you're one of those people that was up and at the gym before you came today. Or maybe you're somebody a little bit like me that has to pay a lot of attention and work really hard to try and get exercise in several times a week or a little bit every day. That's why I appreciate the research and, and you've likely seen it, that four to five minutes, 45 minutes of brisk walking has the same cardiovascular benefit as jogging. So surely we can walk, right? 
And now they're learning that it's cumulative. You can do 15 minutes here, 15 minutes there, 15 minutes, and it all adds up. So surely we can find 15 increments throughout the day. And as busy as we are, I think it makes sense that we try to incorporate exercise into our everyday lives. But this is what I always imagine Mama laughing down from heaven. Because for all generations before us, men and women got their exercise from everyday activities. Now in America, sometimes we pay other people to do these things for us. We pay people to mow our lawns or rake our leaves or shovel our snow or clean our houses. So we have time to go to a health club and work out. And then we get there and drive round and round and round looking for a parking place closer to the door so we don't have to walk so far to get our exercise. How are you going to pay attention, even in 15 minute increments, to get your body, the sleep, the nutrition, the fluids, and the exercise? You know it needs, and it really does deserve. Now, the second part of our lives we have to keep in balance is our mental selves. And in this chaotic, busy world, sometimes we are so busy taking care of other people that we don't take care of our minds either. We have to take time every single day just for a little mental rest. And the very best way to do that really is the very best way. It's just that it is so simple, we discount it. And that's by taking time every day, several times a day, to stop and breathe. You know the breathing they teach in yoga, where they taught us in childbirth classes, where you breathe in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, in, two, three, four, and out slow and deep and easy from your abdomen. That breathing releases a lot of stress, a lot of tension, a lot of endorphins in our brains. I read in the nursing journal, and it was proven to me later, research shows that endorphins have the same molecular makeup as morphine. And we have this on tap and forget to use it by doing rhythmic things like breathing, walking, laughing. That breathing is a great coping skill. One, I learned the hard way. As Ryan mentioned in the introduction, thank you, Ryan, I was caught up in helping to bring the babies out of Vietnam at the end of the war. Now, it's reasonable for somebody to say, how did a young 25-year-old nurse and mom and wife get caught up in that? I still have no idea. But I know it started when I was a little girl and I went trick-or-treating for UNICEF and learned that two and a half cents could buy a carton of milk and save a child's life. And I was a little girl and I decided I was going to adopt a child someday. And on the very day that Mark asked me to marry him, I told him that and it became our dream. So these things must have been on my mind that day when I was pushing our two little girls in the stroller at the mall. And I came upon a bake sale for Friends of Children of Vietnam. They were raising money for the war orphans and I wanted to help. So I stopped to buy a dozen cupcakes. I understand that is all I ever intended to do for the orphans of the world. But have you ever had things that start really small and you get way involved? Well, that's what happened to me. I became the chapter president. And we raised five tons of supplies to send to Vietnam in three years. And that's when the national office then in Denver called and asked if I'd be the first, uh, the next escort to go to Vietnam and escort six babies, six, back to their pre-assigned adoptive homes. But between the day I said, yes, I would go. And the day before I left, the bombing went from 100 miles outside of Saigon to right outside the city limits. And I was greeted that day when I landed with, have you heard the news? Last night, President Gerald Ford okayed Operation Baby Lift. You won't help us take out six babies. You'll help us take out 300. 300, that's what I knew. I was on an assignment bigger than me. So I walked into this two-story, uh, let me see, we're going to share. Mm. I don't know why my slides are stuck. Walk into this two-story building that normally houses just 10 little kids that were two babies that were too sick to be in their homes. 
the foster homes that we have, but I went into the downstairs stairs where there, every inch of floor was covered with a mat and a baby. And then I went upstairs and there's a season, season, season of more babies. And this is the very first picture taken of me in Vietnam. I'll never forget it. I was holding that little girl with a shaved head. And I said to Carol, my friend that went with me, take this, my very first picture here in Vietnam. And friends, then on the third day, a miracle happened. The director said, Leanne, you probably figured this out. I hadn't. She said, because of Operation Baby Lift, you're going to be assigned one of the 100 babies gathered here because you and Mark applied for adoption. And we know that. And you know, expected a child in three years. Well, guess what? You go walk into the next room and choose a son. Choose a son. And I went into that room of 100 babies. And a little nine month old boy took one look at me, crawled across the room into my arms, my heart, and our family. And we had a son. This is Mitch on my right knee looking at you. That's my absolute conviction God created this child to be our son. No clue I was conceived in another womb in another land. I know God made him only for us. And if I'd have had a doubt, it would have been erased. Because a week I got back from Vietnam, Carol came racing to my house one day to say, Leanne, I have that very first picture you had me take of you. Do you remember? I said, oh, yes. I was holding a little girl with a shaved head. She said, well, I have that picture here. And there's only one other person in the background. Mitch. <laughs> Three days before he picked me. Just waiting for his mama. So now I had a son and a mission within the mission. But getting all the kids to the airport was not easy, did you know? You can fit 22 in a Volkswagen van. And from there, we take him to the airport where there's a C-141 cargo jet. They had 22 cardboard boxes side by side and three to four babies in a cardboard box. There were nine of us to take care of a hundred babies. Imagine your worst shift ever, <laughs> but it was joyful work, bring the babies to freedom and to families. And when people see that on the 25th anniversary, I got to go to a reunion and meet 25, pardon me, a hundred of the young men and women I helped to bring up. And it was on that 25th anniversary that President Gerald Ford heard I was going to be in the same town he was going to be in. And he asked if he could meet me. <laughs> me, President Ford wanted to meet me. When people see all of this, they say, wow, Leanne, that was some adventure. That's the truth. Wow, Leanne, you were so brave. That's not the truth. Things happened to me there that brought me to my knees. I was no hero. I was no hero. I was just this ordinary nurse and mom and wife caught up in something so over my head. I was grappling for anything I could to help me cope. Now it's unlikely that you're ever going to be asked to rescue babies in cardboard boxes in a war zone. But God knows you rescue children every day with what you do. Don't forget to use your breathing as your first mental balance tool. And there's a second mental balance tool I really believe in, and that's the power of positive thinking. I read that book by Dr. Norman Vincent Peale when I was just in my 20s, and I knew he was right. We get what we expect in life. We get what we think about. We become our most dominant thought. We get what we speak. And then a surgeon took this to another level. His name was Bernie Siegel. He wrote an amazing book called Love, Medicine, and Miracles, because he was a physician that learned that the people that had positive thinking and visualization were getting better after his operations when sometimes other people weren't. And he quit his day job to prove that what we think about can change our body function. He did lots and lots of research, and there's so many stories, but one of the first ones was when he very first started, and there was a young 30-year-old woman who had been diagnosed with inoperable abdominal cancer, no hope, given only six months to live. Well, she wouldn't accept that. She said every day she was going to visualize that her cancer cells were carrots and her white blood cells were rabbits. And for an hour every day, she would visualize rabbits eating carrots in her system. 
and in three months, her tumor was gone. He documented this as a scientific study. See, our bodies and minds don't distinguish the difference between experience and visualization. They react as if they both happen. There was a basketball team that, that half the basketball team did free throws every day for an hour. The other visualized them perfectly, shooting perfectly for an hour. And at the results, at the competition, the results were the same. Bernie Siegel tells the story of a man in the chemotherapy study. Half of the men got the chemo, the other half of the 400 got a placebo. But they were all told if you're getting the chemo, you might lose your hair. And of the men that got the placebo, 18% of them lost their hair. Why? Why? Because our bodies don't distinguish the difference between visualization and experience. Your mind is a computer. You control the input. How are you going to incorporate positive thinking and visualization change, not only your health, but your happiness? Now there's a third mental balance tool we too often forget to utilize. This good nurse didn't forget. She was raised and had nurses training in North Dakota and then transferred to Texas. She said it was a bit of a culture shock. No longer did she hear people say, how are you doing? <laughs> she heard them say, como estas? It was a largely Hispanic population there. She loved her job in post-op recovery. One day, the OR nurse wheeled a man into her cubicle and gave her a report. This is Mr. Martinez, 60-year-old Hispanic male, had abdominal surgery, general anesthesia, but this man will not respond. His vitals are fine. We've kept him back there so long because we can't wake him up. Well, of course, the good nurse did her own assessment. So enough, everything was absolutely perfect. Mr. Martinez, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Martinez, Mr. Martinez. Finally, her co-worker said, you keep shouting his name. You're driving us nuts. Why don't you try to wake him in his native language? And they told her what to say. So she repeated it over and over in her mind until she got to the bedside. She put her hands on the man's shoulders, her face just 10 inches from his, and shouted, Besame, Mr. Martinez, Besame. Well, don't know what surprised her the most. Mr. Martinez sitting straight up and quite alert for the hysterical laughter of her coworkers. She said, what did you have me say to him? And they gave her the translation. I bet some of you know it, say it out loud. Uh -huh. Kiss me, Mr. Martinez, kiss me. <laughs> laughter, that's our third mental balance tool. And I think sometimes as nurses, we forget to laugh. Surely we would never laugh at anyone. But wouldn't you agree? We have to laugh at ourselves. We have to laugh at situations. Laughter really is the best medicine. There's an organization that called Therapeutic Humor of Doctors and Nurses who research <clears throat> and report. And laughter really does boost your T cells, makes you more immune, it lowers your blood pressure. Kids know it's the best medicine. They laugh 400 times a day. Do you know how many times grown-ups laugh? One study said 17, another said 11, somebody told me four. And you know people who can't meet that quota, don't you? So I want you to think about what makes you laugh and put it in your life. And then self-care for healthcare, as a matter of fact, I have a how-to in every chapter. And there's a chapter, of course, on laughter and then a whole list of how-to put laughter into your life. My girlfriend had a really good idea. You may want to try that. She went to work one day with a piece of tape here. The next day, the piece of tape was clear down here. The other day, it was clear up here. Finally, a coworker said, what's with that tape on your arm? She said, oh, I put that there to show where I've had it up to. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. Yeah. Left is the best medicine, and we need to laugh 400 times a day like kids. So make a list. What makes you laugh? And put it in your life every day. Now there's a fourth mental balance tool we too often forget. Besides the slow, deep, easy breathing, besides the positive thinking and visualization, besides the laughter, the fourth is forgiveness. And we waste a lot of our life and even our health when we fail to forgive. So starting today, we start to forgive. First of all, ourselves for your past mistakes, regretted decisions. Starting now, we forgive ourselves. Because friends, that's who we were then, based on what we knew then. 
It's not who we choose to be today. And starting today, we forgive somebody else, no matter how horrific the offense, and I know some of them are really horrific. But what took me too long to realize is, if you don't forgive somebody, it doesn't hurt them. It only hurts us. So why would we allow someone who caused us so much pain? Why would we give them the power to continue to hurt us by giving us sleepless nights and upset stomachs and headaches? We have to forgive whether we think they deserve it or not. We do. And forgiveness is freeing. Bernie Siegel, that I mentioned earlier, shared this true story in chicken soup with a nurse's soul, and, and they're all true. A woman who, actually a man who worked at this care facility for many years, it seemed his job every day was to lift Miss Sally to the chair because Miss Sally hadn't walked in six years. One day as he was lifting her, she looked at him and said, you look like a man of faith. Does God really forgive everything? He said, yes, ma'am, he really does. Later, she looked at him again. Are you sure that God always forgives everything? Yes, ma'am. I'm sure. Before he left work that night, she looked him in the face a third time and said, can you promise me that God always forgives everything? Yes, ma'am, I promise. Well, when I was just a teenager, I stole all the family silver and I sold it so I'd have enough money to get married. I've never told a single soul to this very day. Can he still forgive me this late? Absolutely. Just ask. Well, the man went on home and came back to work the next day. He was called into his supervisor's office, who said, what did you tell Miss Sally last night? She simply asked if God forgave always. I assured her he always does. Why? Because at three o'clock this morning, Miss Sally came walking down the hall, put her teeth and her Bible on the nurse's desk, said, won't be needing these anymore, walked back to her room, lay down, and died. And friends, almost every time I tell that story, a nurse in that audience tells me one just like it, because forgiveness is freeing. So starting today, besides yourself, who are you going to forgive? Now, there's that third part of our lives we have to keep in balance, and that is our spiritual selves. Now, statistics show this still. About 90% of Americans believe in a God, a higher power, a supreme being. So to that 90% of you to whom I say, you need to be in touch with that power, that divine, every single day. You can't just wait for weekends for that either. Even if it's as little as 15 minutes for quiet prayer or meditation or reflection during that deep breathing. But I can hear what you're thinking now, rightly, and where am I supposed to come up with 15 minutes? You already told me now I have to stop and walk several times a day, and I've got to stop and breathe several times a day, and now I've got to go to bed earlier at night, so where am I supposed to come up with 15 minutes? Well, this was hard for me too. So I thought maybe the good way to discipline myself was to buy a little daily reading book, and I, I think it really is a good idea if you want one. But being the task-oriented nurse I am, I couldn't sit down and read it, way too busy for that. But I could read it every day while I dried my hair. So I opened up on the bathroom counter, and every day while I dried my hair, I was reading it out loud. And a couple weeks into this, it occurred to me, you know what, Leanne, I think you're supposed to sit down. Shut up. <laughs> and listen. Just listen to that deep inner voice. Now, you can call it supreme being. You can call it intuition you can call it gut feeling you can call it holy spirit whatever you believe in but what i do know is that deep inner voice is the divine guiding our lives and we cannot hear it in the chaos so how are you going to find 15 minutes a day to be still and connect with your supreme and listen it is hard isn't it keeping that physical mental and spiritual i still struggle with it I get in a writing mode and then I'm not eating right. And so then I eat better, but I'm not exercising enough. That's when I need to take a step back and take a look at my life. That's what I'm asking you to do today, to take a step back, take a look at your life. Are one of the three, the physical, mental, or spiritual, a little out of balance? And if you realize that, then you need to ask for what you need to put it back into balance again. 
ask, not blamefully, but lovingly, first of all, of yourself, giving yourself permission. When I read that list of symptoms, do you know that your body, mind, and spirit need more attention? Maybe you need to ask of your coworkers or your supervisors or your family or your church group, what do you need to better care for your mind, body, and spirit? And then you should be more like a toddler. Anybody have a toddler? Have you noticed that when they figure out what they want, they ask for it until they get it? I want juice, 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 till somebody gets the kid juice right. But as nurses, we tend not to do that. First of all, it takes us way too long to figure out it's juice we need or want. And if we do, then we don't always ask for it. Instead, we tend to do something more like, I didn't get any juice today. I hardly ever get juice anymore. We need to ask for our juice to put our lives into balance, physically, mentally, and spiritually. And you know, I get a lot of questions about life balance. And when people ask me about work-life balance, I ask them this, what is the number one priority in your life? And are you living it? And I know I challenge people sometimes when I suggest a priority is not what you say it is. A priority is how you spend your time, right? I mean, we can't give lip service to one thing and say that's the priority if we spend our time doing something else because clearly what we spend our time doing is what we've made the priority, is it not? So what is the number one priority in your life? Are you living it? We have to remember we are always juggling balls of responsibility. We need to figure out which of these balls are rubber and which are glass. The rubber ones, which is usually all of our stuff. And honestly, even our jobs, if we drop them, they could bounce back to be replaced. But the glass ones, which are usually our own health, and the people that we love, if they're broken, they can be irretrievably broken. Don't drop them. And when you think about this, this is really a lot about choice and we have a lot more power to choose in our life than we exercise. And sometimes we give this power to choose away to somebody else because now we can choose to say, so starting today, I will care for me. And I made a little an acronym for you so you can feel me nagging, uh, pardon me, advocating for you, even when I'm not around. The care for me reminds you, see, connect with your higher power, the God you believe in every single day. And ask for your juice. What do you need to better care for yourself, mind, body, and spirit? And rest and sleep like you know your body needs. And eat right like you know your body needs. And four times a day, that slow, deep, easy breathing. And mind your mind. Besides the breathing, the positive thinking, the laughter, and forgiveness. And exercise. I put this at the, almost the end of every list I make, but I want you to put it at the top of yours. Try to get 45 minutes of exercise in at least three times a week. I'll let you take a screenshot of this so you can hear me advocating when I'm not around. And when you do these things, my friends, you can start to live by a new motto. And as we close, I want to share with you my new motto that I'm giving you. Now it's your new motto. And your new motto is, today I will also care for me and truly live my priority. I want you to say it out loud. I want to hear you. Today I will also care for me and truly live my priority. And can I remind you how lucky you are to be a part and work with an organization like School Health who want that for you. You know, there must've been a thousand speakers they could have chosen for you today, but they sincerely care about you, your mind, your body, and your spirit. And they want to tell you about self-care for healthcare because they know it's really, really hard out there. And there are those days you feel like, yes, but I'm just one little person. It feels like I can't get it all done. I, I can't make everybody happy. Some days I can't make anybody happy. I can't take all the discomfort and the pain away. And on those days you wonder, is my little part really worth all this? And I'm here to remind you, yes, it is. Because everything you do matters in ways that you'll probably never even know about. You touch kids' lives in ways that they 
are impacted and you may never know about it. I make sure there's a nurse's stole story in each of the chicken soup books I write. And those prove that nurses, I meant um, school nurses stories in each of the books. And those nurses prove, and those stories prove, that you're making a difference in ways that you'll never know. There was a sign above a, a burn unit in Vietnam when I was there that made that point. An American plastic surgeon set up the clinic to help the kids that had been burned by the war. And above the doorway, he wrote, it's better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. And that's what you do every day. You light your single candles. And in doing so, you inspire everybody, even the students you do, and your coworkers and the teachers and your community. You teach others to light their candles too. And you're making a tremendous difference in this world. That's why I dedicated Chicken Soup the Soul, Inspiration for Nurses, to you. And the dedication reads, to all nurses who perhaps more than any other group on earth truly ease the suffering of the world. So for every hand you've held, every candle you've lit, every student life you have touched, every teacher you've impacted, I thank you, thank you, thank you. Because while sometimes you might feel your part is small and ordinary, you are making an extraordinary difference in this world. Because you, my friends, you are the heroes. And I applaud you. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. We've had some questions come in during the presentation, so we'd like to take a moment to ask those now. Uh, before I get into those, I would just remind everyone who's still listening, if you have a question for Leanne, please send it in through the questions interface on the GoToWebinar uh, control panel, and we will have Leanne answer those for you. I uh, want to start with just a couple of housekeeping questions. Uh, I'm seeing people ask if they can get a copy of the recording so they can see uh, portions they may have missed. Yes, we will email a copy of the recording out to you this afternoon. So just keep an eye on your uh, email for that and you should have that later today. Um, let's see, first of all, um, and I read through this question, I, I think that we have all experienced um, you know, these kinds of days that feel really, really tough. Uh, Ellie in Illinois is asking, what are some ways that you remember to have grace and compassion towards patients or students as a nurse, even when things go really, really tough during your day? Your boy is, is there, the compassion fatigue is a real big term out there, isn't it? Because I always say we have one bucket of energy. We can use it up physically, mentally, or spiritually, but when it's used up, it's used up. And sometimes we use all of our energy on that compassion. And sometimes then when we're so depleted, it's hard to feel that compassion. And it helps me when I realize that everybody's on their own journey. And each of the students and the teachers and the people that you encounter have their own difficulties in lives in ways that we probably never know. And the burdens that they are carrying, sometimes are too great for us to impact. But we can always impact some by giving that compassion, even in spite of it. And I also believe that really we can't be compassionate. I couldn't as a nurse. I couldn't be as patient when I was at the bedside and when I was working with the students. When I was a, I was a, I was a school nurse for four years, and uh, in a program for juvenile delinquents, and that took me a lot of patience and compassion to realize they're in their place and they're on their own journey. But I also knew when I was depleted, when I was exhausted. It was hard for me to have that same compassion. So that's what I'm going to advocate for you again, to take really, really good care of you first. Thank you. Thank you, Leanne. I've got a question from Susan in Florida, and she talks about how she knows sometimes that she needs to ask her for help, but her day gets so busy that she forgets to actually ask for help. How can we remind ourselves that it's okay to ask for the help that we need as school nurses? And I think a big part of that, is, yes, I know you're so busy to even stop and ask. I bet I could just get myself in a hurry or let it go because I don't have time to even stop and ask for help. But I think that's really true. And, and to realize it is not coming from a place of weakness or disorganization. It comes from a place of power and strength. And when to ask for help, not to do it in a blameful way, 
of how am I supposed to get all of this done and nobody's offered to help me, but it, to really make it as a statement. And I start with this, in order to take the best possible care of the kids, like I know you want me to, I'm going to need some assistance with the da 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 da. And even to say, in order to take the best care of the kids, I'm going to have to take about a 15 minute break here and have something to eat or to drink some fluids for the first time today. And know that that comes, you're always role modeling. So I think to role model and asking for what you need to care for your body, mind, and spirit, other people notice, and then that gives them permission as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, another question that has come in here. Um, Tracy asks, what are some ways that we can refocus on the reasons why we became a nurse so that we can remember why we love our profession? That's so hard, but it's so easy. Remember every good experience you ever had. And this is going to sound just like a blatant plug, but honestly, when you read stories from other nurses in Chicken Soup for the Nurse's Soul, it reminds you why we entered the profession and why we stay. And on those days, when the very first chapter in self-care for healthcare is to write down a, a, write a little paragraph about why you entered the profession in the first place, what drew you here? And then everybody shares their best stories. Think of the people, the difference you've made. And sometimes it's good even to jot them down, get a little notebook or a, a journal if you want, and just write those positive stories, the differences that you have made, and read those often. And that's how, what reinforces it, that, um, the impact that we're making. And anytime we can hang with other nurses and not get into the stinking thinking, but to get into the share your best story with me. What's the best student story you've had or the best nurse story you've had? And that reaffirms why we're called. And it is, this is a calling. Working in nursing is a calling. And you answered that call. And all those stories will remind you why you do. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I've got time for, it looks like one or two more questions here. Uh, I've got a call from Shannon, or not call, not a call, a question from Shannon, who says, do you have tips on how to handle the frustrations that have arisen for school nurses during the ever-changing COVID protocols and rules at schools and the ever-changing ways that people want to, to follow them or not? Boy. Isn't that, honestly, that's a big part where the forgiveness comes in, doesn't it? <laughs> really, I often joke, we have to forgive all the people that hoarded the toilet paper and the people that didn't mask or did mask or didn't, you know, get the booster or did get the booster. And, and just to have patience with all of that is, is huge. And it's very difficult, isn't it? To be patient enough with them and doing all of those challenges. Read the first, the first line of her question again, would you, Ryan? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have tips on how to handle the frustrations that have arisen for school nurses? Yeah, on the, the how to handle the frustration. Honestly, you're going to think this is crazy because you're already too busy. On your calendar, you have to schedule everything else. Schedule 10 minutes and close your door and breathe. Or play some music that energizes you or brings you peace. Just allow yourself that five or 10 minutes just to focus and recenter. Maybe you're going to eat something healthy in the meantime or drink something healthier in the meantime, but we schedule everything else. We have to just make this a priority to take really good care of you. And I think that's the best way that to handle all the frustrations is when we take the time to just focus on ourselves for a little bit, to renew, to get that strength. I, for me, I say a little prayer. Sometimes I'm just so darn frustrated, I can hardly stand it. So I go sit someplace uh, on a bench or um, and shut my office door or uh, bathroom stalls are good because sometimes that's the only break we get, right? And so just to refocus and re-energize and focus on yourself, breathe, read something positive, um, have some positive affirmations around that on sticky notes or in, in the books that you have. Eh? There are all sorts of books of positive affirmations that you can reinforce that in yourself. Okay, wonderful. Um, got another question in from Alicia who says, how do we go about the dealing with the feeling of defeat when we as school nurses just cannot get everything accomplished that we want to accomplish in a day? Do you know, I can't even imagine being you. Really, when I was a school nurse, I had one school and it was small. And when I look at all that you do and keep track of, and that was even pre-COVID, 
it's overwhelming. And I think maybe to just realize that you can't get it all done. And accept the fact and quit beating ourselves up for it. And, and this is probably where it comes to, and this is easy for me to say, but when you look at all the tasks and all the responsibilities you have, and I'm sure you do that, but to prioritize those, which, which are non-negotiable, which have to absolutely be done this week or this day or, or whatever. And then the next list of those that are sure would are the next on the list, we've got to get to those as well. And you might find that some of those are less pressing, maybe less um, of, a, of a negative influence if they're not all done. And then I really believe we have to go to the people, our supervisors and the people in charge and say, this is what I'm able to do. And look, I did it really well. And this is the next step. I'm able to do this. But some of this, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to be able to get to and have somebody understand that. And that's where it comes to asking for what we need. And I know they'll probably say, we don't have funding, right? But then you have to accept the fact that you can give 100%, but not at your own expense, that you can take care of yourself and give 100% and do the best you can and realize that everything on that list may not get done. That's really excellent advice, Leon. Thank you. I, I think that we're about at time now. I do see that we have a couple of other questions that have come in, but we'll work on providing uh, answers for you. Uh, from Leanne, uh, if we did not have time to get to your question about uh, or, or your question during the presentation today. So just a reminder for everyone, uh, we will be sending out uh, the recording uh, of this broadcast later today, along with your certificate for attending and uh, some other helpful information that uh, that we have been able to put together for you. So keep an eye on that in your email. Um, again, happy School Nurse Day and happy National Nurses Week to all of the nurses out there. Uh, we sincerely thank you for all of the efforts that you put forward on behalf of others, and we are really, really grateful to be able to work with you and, and have some involvement in your day as well. Um, Leanne, is there anything that you'd like to say before we close today? No. Was there going to be a prize or something given away today? I thought somebody... Um, we are, we have been giving away prizes all week and that continues okay, to, uh, we, if you are on our social media channels, uh, check in with our Facebook, check in with our Twitter or Instagram. We have been having a contest run all week and we're giving away daily prizes. We're announcing our grand prize winner tomorrow. So Great. please check in with uh, our social media channels and you can have a chance to win and you can read some really compelling stories that have come in from other nurses as well. That'll help everybody. My final word is take as good a care of you as you do everybody else because God knows you deserve it. And I know what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Leanne. Have a great day. My joy.